I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I believe. 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 I believe this morning we consider the last portion of the Apostles' Creed in this four Sunday sermon series and study. Uh, Today we consider where the Apostles' Creed says, I believe in the church. The scripture lesson for today's message comes to us from the Gospel of Acts, not the Gospel of Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 2. Verses 38 through 47, and you will recognize this as a part of Peter's sermon uh, on the day of Pentecost uh, when the church was born. Hear the word of the Lord as given to us uh, from the book of Acts. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he, t- and he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to breaking and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell the possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent time. Uh, Together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So on the first day of the Church of Jesus Christ, we see essential elements of the church that continue to this very day. Repentance, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sins, the church filled and empowered and equipped and led by the Holy Spirit, those who were being saved added to the church. Discipleship, it says they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, Christian fellowship and community, corporate worship, sacrificial giving and service to those in the community in need. And this last section of the Apostles' Creed that we've been considering, we skipped last week obviously, but three weeks prior to that and today, um, this section of the Apostles' Creed, we move from talking about the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, to talking about the people of God. And in its way of being succinct but also profound, the Apostles' Creed proclaims this about the church. The church is holy. The church is Catholic. 
The church consists of the faithful of all time, past, present, future, uh, and, and of all places, language, and ethnicities. The church is forgiven. The church will be resurrected. The church will never end. Well, it's almost too much material to adequately cover in one sermon, especially on Communion Sunday when the sermon is typically designed to be short. But if I run long, I'm sure my wife will be over here tapping on the, uh, on the pew or something, letting me know that, that my time is up. It's time to stop preaching now. But, uh, but bear with me for just a few moments. Um, according to the Apostles' Creed, to believe in Jesus Christ is to believe in and belong to a community that is active in the world today, but spans centuries backward and centuries perhaps forward. The Greek word for the church is, uh, is ekklesia, used in the New Testament. Uh, now, it is not describing a building like this sanctuary. Church in the New Testament references a group of people. It literally means those who are called out. The church consists of people like you and me who are called out of the world into a dynamic community of faith. The writer of First Peter states it this way called out of darkness into this wonderful light. To answer the call to come out of the darkness of this world means we, we enter into a community of support and love, but also a community of discipleship and service. Alistair McGrath, they, uh, who I uh, referenced on the first Sunday of our, of our sermon series, a uh, professor, um, a, a theologian, a, 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 an author, uh, says that, the, that this community, community called the church has four identifying characteristics. The church is one, he says. The church is holy. The church is Catholic. The church is apostolic. Now, the Apostles' Creed, as you already have, have noticed, uh, notes that the church is holy and Catholic. The characteristic of the church is one, O-N-E, the church is one, is implied when the creed states the church and not the churches. The church and the one church, the one church uh, that the Apostles' Creed refers to and that we are a part of is based and built on the foundation, foundation of Jesus Christ. Paul affirms this in his letter to the church at Colossae when he says, Christ is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn, uh, the firstborn from the dead, so that he may come to have first place in everything. The church is not a building, but a body of people that acknowledges Jesus Christ as its head. Now, there are churches, uh, uh, plural, within uh, the church of Jesus Christ, within the church of Jesus Christ, within the body of Jesus Christ, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Catholic, uh, Baptist, and so on. Uh, we have lots of cousins around the world, and, uh, and at our family reunions, we have some cousins who we have a lot in common with, but we have other cousins. We wonder if they really are our cousins. Um, but the difference of the various churches and denominations, from the Greek Orthodox Church over in Tarpon Springs to, to the Primitive Baptist Church in the backwaters of Sopchapi. Do you all know where Sopchapi is? Sopchapi, Florida? Uh, just as a poll, how many of you know where Sopchapi, Florida is? Oh, come on. Oh, all right. I'm going to have to tell you. Sopchapi, if this is the peninsula of Florida and this is the panhandle, Sopchapi is right there uh, in the armpit. Um, um, so from, from, from the Greek Orthodox Church in, uh, in Tarpon Springs to the, to the Primitive Baptist Church in the backwaters of Sopchapi uh, and all the expressions of the Christian faith around the world, uh, it doesn't negate the fact that the church is one and Jesus is the head of all. The essentials of our faith the main being that Christ is the head of the church, but the essentials of our faith that we have in common hold us together. And in the non-essentials, we agree to disagree. We agree to disagree on the non-essentials and, and, and drink sweet tea together at our family reunions. A quote attributed to John Wesley, but St. Augustine before, uh, before John Wesley is this, in essentials, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials of our faith, liberty. 
in all things charity. Now, uh, it's often cited as cousins and even siblings in the same family or denomination try to reach a consensus regarding our core theological convictions and how we will live them out in the life of the church and in the world. The quote typically offers us helpful rules of engagement uh, for family arguments. But here are two important questions. What are the essentials? That's, that's question number one. What are the essentials? Question number two is, who determines the essentials? These questions, these two questions are pertinent for our context we find ourselves in today in our own denomination. Well, thankfully, our forefathers and foremothers of the faith have handed down to us essential statements of our faith that was handed down to them. From the fourth century till today, we have these biblically rooted essentials of the faith in the Apostles' Creed and in the Nicene Creed, in the Athanasian Creed, and in the Chalcedonian Creeds. We believe the essentials, as described in the Apostles' Creed, not only bind the church together, bind churches together into the, the church, but call us to accept them by faith, contend, uh, contend for them, defend them, and hand them down to our children, the next generation of the church. Without the essentials, the church's message becomes tepid and leads to accommodation, uh, accommodating the sinfulness of the culture that we live in. Back some years ago, I can't, it's hard for me to keep track of time, but back some years ago, it may be in decades ago, uh, there was a popular movement of uh, fad, you might call it a fad or a trend. Uh, you might remember, uh, there was an acronym, WWJD, that stood for, What Would Jesus Do? There were billboards, there were bumper stickers, there were, there were, you remember those rubber bracelets? I think that's where the rubber bracelet thing began with the WWJD uh, on the rubber, bla oh, rubber bracelets. What would Jesus do? Now, I'm not criticizing the trend. Every follower of Christ should live their lives trying to be Christ-like as they live out their faith. But oftentimes, when asking, what would Jesus do? And applying the answers to ethical and moral situations, encouraging unhealthy lifestyles, it became a tool of accommodating sinfulness. Because the answers to what would Jesus to do weren't informed by Scripture. And if the answer to any what would Jesus do question isn't rooted and grounded in Scripture and the orthodox teachings of the church, the essentials as we have them, the answer is based on, well, that's what I would do. Or that's what you would do. And not what the Jesus of our Holy Scriptures and the witness of the apostles would do. We believe the essentials, as described in the Apostles' Creed, call us to accept them by faith. And, and through these theological essential, essentials, we find unity. The church is one, and Christ is the head of the body. The church is one. The church is holy. Now, for the most part, unless you're uh, saying the word holy while reciting the Apostles' Creed or singing holy, holy, holy in one of our hymns or something, we're, we, we typically use the word uh, like this. Well, she just acts like she's holier than thou. Or we, we use the word like this. That church down the street that doesn't let out on Sunday afternoon until about 2.30, well, they're just a bunch of holy rollers. And you're too humble to refer to yourself as holy. But the church, the Apostles' Creed states, is holy. Christians are holy. Now, we're holy not because we are such good people and we behave and demonstrate good character. The church is holy because of our calling. We have been called by a holy God to reflect His love in the world. And just like the moon, who has no ability to shine on its own, but reflects the light of the sun, we reflect God's holiness in our lives and in our actions and our love for our neighbor. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is Catholic. Now, because you are astute and well-studied, besides being the best-looking group around, because you are astute and well-studied, 
You know that when we read Catholic with a small c in our creed, that means the universal church and not the Roman Catholic church, which is in itself a large global church. But the Roman Catholic church is, uh, is a, only a part of the universal church. The Greek word uh, katholikos means according to the whole or universal. And affirming, listen, affirming that the church is Catholic is not referring to the Roman Catholic Church. R affirming that the church is Catholic and universal, we are affirming that the church's message is relevant to every age and every station, every situation. And this is important. It's important because how often do you, people, do you hear people say, even, even leaders of the church say, the message of the church just isn't relevant for our modern lives. So when we affirm today, today, the church is Catholic, the church is universal, we affirm that the message of the church is as relevant today as it was on the first day when Peter stood up and preached, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is Catholic. The church is apostolic. Now, <clears throat> except for the title, the Apostles' Creed, the Apostles' Creed uh, doesn't say anything about the church being apostolic. But the creed, written well after the apostles had gone on to their reward and gone on to be with Jesus, continues the teachings of the first apostles. The scripture that I read in your hearing, the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The faith of the great commission, the faith and the great commission given to the apostles by Jesus have become now ours. Jude put it this way uh, in his epistle, I find it necessary to write and appeal to you to contend for the faith that, what, that was once uh, for once and for all entrusted to the saints. McGrath concludes, together these four attributes of the church, one, the church is one, the church is holy, the church is Catholic, the church is apostolic. Together these four attribu attributes of the church point to a worldwide body of believers whose sole foundation is Jesus Christ, who have been entrusted with the apostles' faith and responsibilities to proclaim the gospel throughout history, knowing that it is of continued vital relevance to the human race. The church is one. The church is holy. The church is Catholic. The church is apostolic. We believe in the holy Catholic church and in the communion of the saints. Now, the previous section that I was just referencing speaks to the church as the body of Christ at the head. This section considers the members of that body, us. And as I said a minute ago, and as Justin and Miranda wrote in the study guide that accompanies this sermon series, the New Testament writers never used the word church to describe a building or sanctuary. Surely the buildings came. If you visited the Holy Land, you see how early on the buildings, uh, the buildings and places of worship came. But when Paul writes to the church at Rome or the Colossae or Philippi or, 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 other, or, or, or other places, he's addressing a group of people. The early Christians had no buildings dedicated solely for worship. They worshiped wherever they could, mostly in homes. The church is not a fixed building. The church we affirm in the Apostles' Creed includes all Christians from all denominations, from all over the world, and for all time. Last Sunday was World Communion Sunday. One Sunday out of the year, one Sunday out of the year, that we recall and worship uh, in our worship and liturgy that we're connected to a worldwide network of Christians. The Apostles' Creed helps us recall that every time we say it. And it includes those who have gone ahead of us and those who will follow us. Right now, Anna, our director of, uh, director of youth uh, and also missions, is, is uh, leading a confirmation class. 
uh, and Judah as a representative of the uh, Judah Morris row, as a representative of the confirmation class, is going to come and assist in, in worship, as uh, uh, representatives did at the early service here in the traditional service and also in the, uh, in the uh, contemporary service. And, uh, and the children uh, from our early service came in and participated in communion, and uh, nine of them, uh, it was their first communion. I think we have more children coming in today. Most of our families and children attend the early service, but I think we have uh, more coming in today to participate, and it will be their first communion also. They will follow us, and we're we're trying to teach them the faith that has been entrusted to us so that they can ha- uh, so we can hand it down to them who will come after us and they will be the church when we are sitting in the bleachers with a great cloud of witnesses cheering on the church we believe in the holy and catholic church we believe in the communion of saints and we believe that our sins are forgiven we believe in the forgiveness of sins plural That's helpful. Affirming we believe the forgiveness of sins is another affirmation of what Jesus achieved on the cross. There's no explanation as to how and what and why. We simply believe that Jesus died on the cross and our sins are forgiven. The New Testament gives many images which, uh, when it records and reports the work of Christ on the cross. The Nicene Creed adds, uh, Jesus became human for our salvation. But the Apostles' Creed simply says, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Uh, to summarize the work of Christ, uh, the work of Christ on the cross, we believe in the removal of penalty and debt. We believe Jesus wiped out our guilt by His death on the cross. And forgiveness, forgiveness is necessary for a relationship to be restored, a relationship that's been broken to be restored. Forgiveness involves uh, 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 taking the initiative. Someone has to take the initiative to approach the other party, acknowledging that the relationship is broken. God the Father, through His Son Jesus Christ, has approached us with forgiveness, and it's up to us to accept God's forgiveness. We believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. The Apostles' Creed opens with a statement of faith in God. It closes with a statement of faith that one day we will stand in His presence. Earlier in the creed, it proclaimed the reality of Christ's actual physical bodily resurrection. And now it proclaims the hope that all believers will share in His own glorious resurrection. Didn't Jesus say, listen, don't let your hearts be troubled Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and you will be where I am. To believe, to believe is to be born again, to come to newness of life, life that never ends. To come to faith in Jesus is to begin in a new relationship with God and that relationship does not end with death some have said some have said that death deepens our relationship with God because death sweeps away all of the obstacles to the experiencing uh, to experiencing the presence of God and finally note that the creed ends with amen amen This reminds us that the creed is as much of a prayer as it is a statement of faith. The creed is a prayer for deepening our faith and our commitment to God, whose greatness that whose greatness we have just spoken of. To say Amen, to close the creed, is to pray that the power and presence of God might touch our lives, deepen our love for God, and illumine our understanding of His holy scriptures. On the first Sunday of this series, we saw that belief and faith involves more than mental assent. Belief and faith uh, uh, involves trust and obedience. If the study of and the saying of this creed moves us 
out into the world, if the study of, of the creed uh, uh, makes us more determined to witness to others about our faith in Jesus Christ, if the saying and the study of this creed helps us to serve others, then the creed will have done its job. I believe, I really believe, and I hope you do as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.